Part 1. Look at the first part of a flowchart that shows you what to do if you have a headache. Listen and complete the notes using no more than two words for each answer. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. There are various different reasons why you may have a headache. Some of them are not serious and can be treated easily, perhaps by simply taking a pain-killing tablet, like an aspirin. Some headaches, however, may be a symptom of something far more serious, and you should get immediate advice. First of all, ask yourself if you think you have other symptoms that suggest you have a cold. Do you have a fever, a runny nose, a cough or a sore throat? Have you been sick at all? If you have, then you probably have a bad cold or the flu, and the headache is just one of the symptoms. Get plenty of rest and drink plenty of water. There are many types of medicine that you can buy at a chemist, and these will relieve some of the symptoms. Remember, though, medicine will not actually cure the condition, and you might prefer to just drink hot water with some lemon and honey, and take a couple of aspirin. Now, if you don't think you have a cold, you must ask yourself how bad the headache is. If the headache is really bad and you have a stiff neck, there may be a bigger problem. If you feel that normal light is hurting your eyes, it may also be cause for concern. Meningitis is a serious condition. It is caused by an infection of blood around your brain and spinal cord. The condition can seriously affect your brain if not treated immediately. You must see your doctor or go immediately to the nearest hospital. If you do not show these symptoms, you may still have something that needs treatment quickly. You may have an injury of some kind and you must try to remember if you have hit your head at all in the last few days. If you have, you may be suffering from concussion. Concussion occurs after an injury to the head when blood pushes against the brain. It is very serious and you must make sure that you get treatment immediately. Now, if you don't remember any recent injury, you must ask yourself if you feel... Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Extract 1. Acrophobia is a fear of heights. A lot of people confuse it with vertigo, which is a normal feeling that people get in a very high place. Acrophobia is a phobia and can be very dangerous. The person who suffers may panic and want to escape the situation. The quickest way to escape is to jump. People who suffer from acrophobia will avoid being at the top of tall buildings and will not like going up long staircases. It may be a phobia that is a result of past experience. Children see things fall and break and so become very frightened of the same thing happening to them. Extract 2 Now this phobia has a number of different names. Brontophobia, astrophobia, and coronophobia. It is a phobia of storms, especially storms with thunder and lightning. It is especially common in children, but can continue into adult life. People who have a serious phobia worry when the spring turns to summer. They expect there to be more storms during that time. When a storm is approaching, they feel very uncomfortable and even physically sick. Many of those who suffer, especially children, hide when there is a storm, 
perhaps in a cupboard or under the bed. Adults with the condition may watch weather forecasts on television every 30 minutes to check that the weather is good. Extract 3 Now, most people are, to some degree, afraid of dying, but necrophobia is a fear of anything connected with death. It is more than a fear of dying. People who have necrophobia are terrified of seeing dead things. They will stay away from museums where there are mummies or skeletons and avoid any images of dead people. They will panic if they see a dead animal in the street or in a forest and will avoid watching a program or movie that shows people dying or near to death. This phobia may be something that is natural in all of us to some degree but is probably made worse by seeing a dead person or a favourite pet dying at some time in the past. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. Listen to the conversation between Daniel, a Spanish student, and Kira from Greece. Kira is asking about medicine for a cold. And then answer the following questions. First, you have some time to read the questions. Now, listen to the conversation. Hello, Daniel. How are you? Not so bad, thanks. What about you? To tell the truth, I've got a terrible cold. Ah, oh, sorry to hear that. Poor you. Maybe it's the change in the weather, or maybe you've been working too hard lately. Well, it must be the weather. Bless you. Have you taken any medicine? No, I haven't. Can you recommend anything? Now, let me see. I got some tablets a couple of months ago when I had a cold. Do you remember the name? Not exactly, but they were black and white capsules, sort of cylindrical shaped, and the label on the bottle had a name printed at the top in block letters, and I think the bottle was square. I'm not exactly sure. The name might have been something like... Vigilan or Vegilan. How is it spelt? If I remember correctly, it's V E G I L A N. Vegilan. I'll just make a note of that. Thanks. Not at all. And I hope you feel better soon. Me too. By the way, Daniel, where is the nearest chemist? Oh, that's easy. From here you go directly south to the second main street. And then you turn left. Continue straight along past the church, and at the next intersection turn right. It's on the left, the second shop after the bank, uh, which is on the corner. You can't miss it. I think I know it. It's just opposite the shoe shop, and there's a green grocer's between it and the bank. You got it. Mind how you go. Thanks. Well, I'm off now. Bye. Cheerio. See you soon. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. Now, listen to the interview. Good afternoon, Mr. Brown. Do sit down. Now, tell me, 
What made you apply for this job? Well, I've been wanting to improve my position for some time, and it seemed to me that the job you advertised would give me an opportunity to learn more about marketing and sales techniques in general. Where are you working at present, Mr. Brown? Well, actually, I haven't got a job at the moment. I had a job as chief clerk in the buying department of a retail store, Johnson and King. I expect you've heard of them. But to tell the truth, I didn't quite hit it off with the sales manager. Oh, why was that, Mr. Brown? Well, he was rather old-fashioned in his methods, and the sales policy of the firm seemed to me too slow. I'm a great believer in the personal approach to selling. I took a course in business management at the London Commercial College, and I'm afraid I found Johnson and King's methods very out of date. They first opened in 1880, you know, and I don't think they've changed their ideas since then. Really? In that case, you may be interested to know that our firm first started business in 1870, and we believe that the old slogan "the customer is always right" still holds good today. I'm afraid our chairman Samuel Jackson, great great grandson of the original founder of the firm Josiah Jackson. Does not approve of high-powered modern selling technique, and with some justification, as our export figures show, we base all our sales technique on Peterson's theory of salesmanship, published in nineteen hundred. I-, I presume you've read it.、Oh, well, actually, no, but I'll make a point of getting one from my local library without delay. Do that, Mister Brown, and then come and see me again. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a telephone conversation between two people about a flat. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-six. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-six. Hello, this is Simon Marshall. I spoke to you the other day about renting flat three A. Oh yes. Hello, Simon. What can I do for you? Well, there are a few health and safety things I'd like to run through, if that's okay. Yes, fine. Right. Well, the first thing. Bearing in mind it's quite an old house, is whether there's any damp. I'm thinking here of the exterior walls and the floor. Well, I've never known any problems with damp there. It was all right last time I checked, certainly, though that was before the recent wet weather. I'd better have another look and get back to you on that. Okay. Now the next thing is the gas supply. Do you have a safety certificate? A current one, that is. We do. All the gas appliances have been checked by a registered engineer. Yes, I was going to ask about that. When did they actually do the inspection? Let me think. They sent an engineer to check something early last year, but no, that wasn't the inspection. Oh, I remember now. It was in the spring. In fact, I've got the certificate here somewhere. Yes, that's it. March twenty second, so it's just over five months ago. And the electricity. When was the last time all the wiring was inspected? I know it doesn't have to be checked as often as the gas, but it's still important, especially in older properties. As it happens, we had an electrician in when we redecorated flat three A. If he looked at everything, then he would have charged us for it. I'll find the bill and check it if you like. Fine. And when was that? 
Uh, the decorators finished just before Easter, so that would be about 18 months ago. Mm -hmm. Just one more point on the electrics. Are there enough plug sockets in the flat? It depends what you mean by enough, really. Well, I've got quite a lot of electrical things. Computer, radio, lamps, kitchen appliances and so on. And I'm wondering whether I could plug them all in without having cables trailing all over the place. I think there's one per room. That's fairly normal in older properties. <laughs> I'll take that as a no, then. <laughs> all right. Now, another safety point. Is there a smoke alarm? Yes, there's one in the kitchen. And is it in good working order? I'll have to try it out and let you know. Right. Now, you mentioned the previous tenants. Do they, or anyone else who's lived in the flat, still have keys to the door? We're very strict about that. Everyone has to hand back the keys when they leave or we don't return the deposit. And those in 3A have always done so. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. OK. Now, there are a few other practical details. Firstly, you mentioned a room where people can leave things, like suitcases and bags and things. Where exactly is that? Is it next to 3A, which I take it is on the third floor? Well, the apartment's on the third, yes. But the storeroom's a little way away, just past the second door to the right. Under the stairs, in fact. But it's on the same floor, isn't it? Yes, it is. Fine. Now, another thing I wanted to check is that there's hot water in the apartment. Oh, yes. It runs off the central heating. That was installed back in the 70s, I think, so there's a permanent supply. Mm, but is it really hot, not just warm or lukewarm? I suppose it depends what you mean by hot. But it's at a constant 60 degrees. Oh, that sounds fine. Yes, it used to be set at 55, but last year the tenants asked us to increase it, so we did. Oh, I'm glad about that. OK, now can you tell me a bit about the yard and the garden? How big are they? Well, the yard at the side of the house is about 20 square metres. Oh, so there's room for my motorbike then. Actually, it's only a 50cc moped, but I like to keep it off the road at night. Yes, there's more than enough space there, even with all the wheelie bins. And the garden? That's much bigger, about 150 square metres. Mm -hmm. um, who looks after it, by the way? Old Mr Collins. He's almost 90, but he's out there every day. Uh -huh. And the last point, the TV. What size screen is it? It's 70 centimetres wide, I think. No, sorry, that was the old one. This one's 80. You can get 90-odd channels on it, so I'm told. Really? So there's a satellite dish on the roof, is there? No, it's cable TV here. It doesn't cost much between everyone, though. Ah, that's very interesting. OK, thanks for your help. I'll be in touch again soon. Thank you. Bye for now. Bye. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You'll hear a lecture on sports injuries. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen to the lecture carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Morning, everyone, and welcome to our regular lecture on health issues. This series of lectures is organised by the Students' Union. It's a great pleasure for me to welcome Mr. David Greenbaum, a physician in sports medicine, to come along and talk to us today. Thank you. You may doubt what good sports medicine can do to non-athletes like you, college students. According to public assumptions, sports medicine doctors deal only with sporting injuries. But actually, we treat general joint problems experienced by average people more than treating people who hurt themselves by playing sports. So, whether you're an athlete or not, a sports medicine physician can help you start off every day on the right foot. If you are a college athlete or a sporty person, you must stay at the top of your game. But how do you maintain best physical fitness? You should be under the watchful eye of your sports team physician. Sports medicine doctors offer total care treatment, such as customized workouts, immediate care of injuries, and surgery when needed. A sports medicine doctor's training falls within the speciality of orthopedic surgery. As such, it focuses on the cartilage, ligaments, and muscles involved in your body's movement. So, how do injuries happen? Most of us take for granted the intricate interactions of our bones, muscles, and ligaments until they are damaged. When injured, these tissues can degenerate, causing your joints to ache and feel stiff. Even ordinary daily movements, such as walking and bending, may cause a sports injury through overuse. Furthermore, the normal wear and tear on your body's tissue may become more taxing as you age. To prevent such problems, especially as you begin a fitness exercise, your sports medicine doctor offers total care. This includes X-rays to identify potential trouble spots. Afterwards, he helps you set an exercise routine that fits your body's present condition. Do you know your joints? Your body's most complex structural feature is its joints. Your joints allow you to grasp, twist, sit, and even feed yourself. Repetitive motions, however, may lead to chronic overuse of the soft tissue connecting bones at the joints. This overuse can result in injuries such as tennis elbow or even carpal tunnel syndrome. A more severe type of injury occurs when you lose your balance, thereby putting a joint under abnormal stress. Worse still, you could suffer a bone fracture. When a traumatic injury happens, effective medical care is crucial. Improper treatment of any joint injury can cause permanent loss of flexibility and reoccurring joint pain. As quickly as possible, the doctor applies ice packs to your injury. Ice deters swelling and inflammation, so you feel less pain. After keeping it iced for the first forty-eight hours after injury, the doctor begins therapeutic exercise of your wounded joint. Recently, a new treatment for degenerating joints has been developed. Which is a product called Orthokin. The treatment involves combining healing proteins with a sample of the patient's own blood. The injured joint then receives an injection of the mixture. This new technology stimulates our own white blood cells to produce large quantities of protective protein. Our cells make this protein naturally, but not in sufficient amounts to protect the damaged cartilage in our joints. It also has the advantage of convenience and lack of side effects. Here are some suggestions on how to prevent sports injuries: use appropriate protective equipment, maintain proper lighting in the training area, have adequate rest, avoid alcohol and drugs in order to prevent injuries, follow a regular fitness training program to improve overall coordination and endurance. Better endurance will absorb pressure and prevent injury. Perform adequate warm-up exercises before training or performance. Avoid performing sports or work when you are sick. Most injuries happen when one is fatigued. Avoid treatment by dubious health practitioners. Use of inappropriate massage, adjustment, and homemade medicine, often with steroids or other non-tested drugs, can cause more damage to the injury. That is the end of part four. 
You now have half a minute to check your answers.